Welcome everyone. We will get started in just a moment. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for a very special evening program, a conversation with Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton about the importance of DC statehood. Washington DC's status as a federal district as opposed to a state comes directly from the constitution. I was born in the district and as a child, I learned that this special status reflected the unique role that Washington plays as the home of our federal government. But what does that actually mean for the more than 712,000 Americans who also call Washington home? They raise families, pay local and federal taxes, serve on juries, fight in America's war, and fulfill all the requirements of US citizenship but they do not have equal representation in Congress or sovereignty over local affairs. That sounds a little less special than the way it was explained to me in school and much more like a fundamental injustice. We have an incredible group of guests this, after, this evening to help us understand the movement for DC statehood and how it fits in with efforts across the nation for a strong, fair, participatory democracy for all. Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton is DC's delegate in the US House of Representatives. Janice Lewis George serves as DC council member for Ward 4. Dr. Derek Musgrove co authored the book Chocolate City A History of Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital. And Beau Shuff is the executive director of the advocacy organization DC Vote. We are honored to welcome all of you this evening. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Director of Policy and Partnerships at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 8,500 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for this evening. Bo Schuff from DC Vote will kick things off and then introduce our keynote speaker, Congresswoman Holmes Norton. We will spend the top of the program in conversation and then share a call to action to help all of us engage in the movement for statehood. In the second half of the program, we'll hear from DC Council member Janice Lewis-George and Dr. Derek Musgrove, then tackle your questions and answers in the session at the end. You don't have to wait though, if you have questions at any point throughout this evening's program, you can send those to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I will keep track of those and, and ask them during the Q&A at the end. If you have any technical difficulties this evening, you can message Will Sedlak and he will help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later tonight, along with recordings of all of our previous, typically lunch and learns, but we're calling this one a dinner and learn. Thank you all for joining us and Bo, I will turn it over to you. It should be fixed, Bo. There we go. Okay. Technical difficulties just to get going. Uh, I want to, my name is Bo Shuff. I serve as the executive director of DC Vote, which is one of the advocacy organizations working to ensure equality for the residents of the District of Columbia through DC statehood. Uh, you all did not come uh, here to hear me speak today, and our esteemed uh, guest of honor and uh, someone that I have had the privilege to work with now for years on this issue uh, is here. And I know that you all wanna speak with her more than me. So I am going to uh, stop what I'm talking about and introduce the uh, formidable champion on the Hill for DC residents, our Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Thank you very much, uh, Bo. I'm pleased to spend uh, 
uh, a few minutes with our main conservation, conservation uh, voters to say uh, some words about DC statehood. We are making real progress on DC statehood. It has passed the House of Representatives twice. The bill is, as you might imagine, HR 51, we would be the 51st state of the United States. The Senate companion bill uh, has also made great progress. We've had a Senate hearing. And importantly, the Biden administration has strongly endorsed DC statehood. Perhaps I can spend my few minutes simply telling you why the nation's capital should become the 51st state. Without statehood, the district does not have any senators and it doesn't have a voting member of Congress. Now I'm not, I don't, I'm not complaining what my constituents should. The reason I'm not complaining is because I do have the vote in committee. I've chaired a subcommittee. I can do everything that any other member can do except cast that final vote on the House floor. Now, I have been able to get bills passed. There's no question about it. I was named the most productive member of Congress in the last Congress. But when I get a bill passed, I don't have two senators to pitch it to. Fortunately, uh, we have many Senate allies who helped me get bills I passed in the House. Um, we are very pleased that our bill passed the House uh, with every Democrat supporting the bill. Perhaps most importantly, according to a very detailed uh, poll, 54% of the American people support statehood. When you get more than half of the American people supporting anything in this day and age, you're on your way to where you need to be. Uh, there are many reasons why, why there should be support for DC statehood. The people I represent pay the highest federal taxes per capita, highest, in the United States, all without a vote in both houses of Congress. Uh, we pay more federal taxes than people in 22 states. The population of the District of Columbia is greater than the population of two states who already have statehood and all that comes with it, Wyoming and Vermont. The District of Columbia has a budget larger than the budget of 12 states who already have statehood. And the District of Columbia has a triple A bond rating. That's a bond rating higher than the bond rating of 35 states. When you have that kind of record, uh, there's no wonder that uh, district residents should be seeking statehood. That is a capsule, capsule version uh, of why I'm asking the voters in Maine to support DC statehood. I have had a meeting with one of your senators. He is not a co-sponsor. Um, your senator, your at uh, is not at large. Your your uh, s senator who is neither Democrat or Republican, um, uh, Senator King, and I have had a good conversation. He seems very open to statehood, though he is not yet a co-sponsor. I'll take your questions and then leave you to the rest of. Uh, this very important meeting.
Thank you so much, Congresswoman. I really appreciate that, that overview and certainly um, really seems like a, a no brainer. <laughs> what, what's the argument to oppose DC statehood? What are we up against? The argument to oppose statehood is essentially political. Remember, the district is trying to get to become the 51st state on its own. Thus far, no state has come, has, has gotten statehood on its own. It's usually two states who come at a time because one is Democratic and one is Republican. The last two were Hawaii and Alaska. <laughs> And they, by the way, changed not long afterward. The district is trying to do it on its own. But when you have 54% of the American people supporting DC statehood, it looks like we could. We, uh, we here in Maine aren't one of the states smaller than, uh, than the, the district in population, but we're not too far above, <laughs> That's above right. that number. <laughs> What, what uh, don't you have, I think you only have two representatives, isn't that right? That's right, that's right. Yeah. And so tell us, what, what can we do to help as, as Mainers? Uh, why, why is it statehood important to us and, and how can we participate? May, uh, you can get to your voters and tell them to tell their Senator, Senator King, uh, to support DC statehood. I think your uh, Republican Senator is probably a lost cause, uh, but Senator King, uh, your Republican Senator is Susan Collins, I think. Senator King is very open, it seems to me, at least from my conversations with him for statehood. So one thing you could do that would be very important is to encourage him to become a co-sponsor of DC statehood. We can do that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we talked a little bit, or, or you talked a little bit about some of the, the challenges that DC faces because DC citizens do not have equal representation in Congress. And I know we'll get into uh, with, with council member Lewis George in a little bit about what local rule looks like, but I, I saw a really wild article recently that Congress actually has intervened and, and kept DC from deciding how much to pay its CFO. Is, is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's a good example. Now, the CFO is, is a chief financial officer, is paid uh, with 100% DC money. But it's an example of bills that require us to go through uh, the Congress. Uh, to get. Um, we have to go through the Congress to get our budget approved, even though almost all of it consists of funds raised in the District of Columbia. We've gotten home rule, but we, but we don't even have total and complete home rule. Well, we're past home rule now. It's time to become the 51st state. What the uh... What's what's one thing that those of us who are maybe are you know folks who are just learning about statehood right now? What's the one thing that we should know? <laughs> I don't know. I went through uh, a list of things that I thought would surprise people. Uh, I think probably, and so I don't think I, there's not anything I haven't discussed. I think um, what would. Uh, stay with Maine voters at a time when they're about to pay their income tax uh, is knowing that the District of Columbia voters pay the highest federal taxes per capita in the United States and don't get a vote in return. So that must be what the, that uh, license plate that we've yes. all seen means. <laughs> Tell us a little bit about that one. That, you, I thought, you know, that, I thought that's what we went and fought a war about. <laughs> but one, we, we got left out. We're trying to get in. 
Congresswoman, how was, was DC treated with federal funds during COVID relief? Well, generally we get the same federal funds as every other state, but during COVID release, we were deprived of more than $700 million. And I've had to struggle to get that back because somebody over in the Senate decided to take that money from the district, not treat it as a state for purposes of federal funding, even though it is always treated as a state. For that one issue alone, <laughs> federal funding, when you get as much funding from residents as we do, <laughs> that's the one thing they give us. Uh, and yet we were deprived of some of that funding. I've gotten it included, and I think it's pending now. Uh, so I think I'm gonna get that through in this Congress. That just seems wild that that, that status can be so variable or almost, a, it seems like a, at someone's whim. That, that's a lot of money to be at somebody's whim. Yeah, the Republican whims. Oh. <laughs> Can, can you tell us a little bit more about veterans in, in the district and, and how, is, is there anything, like what's the connection there? It's a huge connection there. Uh, we have the only veterans who continue to go to war or otherwise serve in the armed forces of the United States without a vote. Imagine representing your country and then you come home and you can't even vote despite that representation and even the loss of life. Have this, this status seems just so strange, right? Have any other states passed through a, a sort of hybrid status of being a, a district before becoming a state? Is this like normal or, or where does this come from? Well, they, they, they do. Uh, there are states in waiting. They do pass through a, st a status uh, where most of these states were treated as territories and they moved on to become states when, th when they were granted full statehood. I see, I see, thank you. Um, right now, it doesn't seem like we can have any conversation about Congress that doesn't include mention of the filibuster. <laughs> is, there a, is there a way uh, for, for DC statehood to happen without abandoning the filibuster or is that gonna be a necessary step? What does the process look like? Well, the filibuster stands in the way of almost all legislation. And yes, statehood. Uh, even though it requires only a majority vote, would be stopped by a filibuster. Uh, the, uh, there's evidence that the filibuster may be on its last legs. And this is the evidence. The Republicans had control of the Senate. They lost control of the Senate this last Congress because even bills that had bipartisan support in the House could not get passed in the Senate. The Senate, when, and it is barely controlled by Democrats, delayed in organizing because Democrats recognized they had control of the Senate and barely uh, because the Republican Senate had refused to do anything. So it has, it, it has occurred at least the Democrats, that if you let the filibuster stand in the way of passing, for example, Biden's Build Back Better or anything of the sort that's now pending, then you too could be on your last legs. So Democrats in the Senate have every reason, and DC statehood is only one reason, and perhaps for them not the most important reason, but they have every reason to want to get rid of the filibuster. Thank you. Is there, how has, how has statehood or DC's lack of statehood uh, impact the, what happened on January 6th? Well, there's a special January 6th committee 
uh, the way it impacted DC was that we couldn't call out our own National Guard. Without statehood or my bill, and we don't need statehood for this, I have a bill that would give the district control over its own National Guard. Uh, because this matter had to go uh, to the Senate, the uh, then president, Donald Trump, didn't call out the National Guard. That's why you've got a, a committee now looking into it. Uh, if in fact, uh, <laughs> it, it should be noted, we couldn't call out the National Guard and what did save the, the day was the DC police force. They were in control of the mayor of the District of Columbia. But we could have saved lives, saved damage, if the district could have called out its own National Guard as well. That we will be able to do when my bill to give the district control over the National Guard passes the House uh, as I expect to happen this session. Well, that sounds like a, a good start. <laughs> Certainly yes. not the end of the, the battle here. I, I'm really curious about how you work with the, the council and the mayor and, and local government, given that you know, you're, you're one and the same, right? Um, what is that relationship like? Well, that administration is embryonic. <laughs> uh, my my um, relationship with elected officials in the District of Columbia is seamless, uh, particularly when you consider that I spend a lot of my time keeping Republicans from trying to overturn bills passed by the local government. So we are on the same page to say the very least. <laughs> What a what a terrific um, what a terrific ally they they have in you and I'm curious and have to ask when DC becomes a state will we be seeing a senator Holmes Norton? I, look after if if it becomes a state I'm still the delegate you can bet your bottom dollar I'll become I'll try to become the senator I shall have earned it. <laughs> I I would say so I like your odds. <laughs> Congresswoman, thank you so much for, for being with us this evening and, uh, and walking us through this, uh, this just absolutely wild status that the, the nation's capital is, is enduring right now. We know you're a, a busy woman and uh, that you've got another, uh, another piece to, to move on to this evening. So we will thank you and uh, pledge our, our support. In just a moment, we're gonna transition and, and share a, a call to action. So everyone, thank you. thank you, thank you. For everyone who is uh, is with us this evening, uh, I imagine that we're all feeling that same sort of sense of okay, we got it, we gotta fix this. This is not right. Uh, later this evening or, or tomorrow morning, you'll get an email from us that includes both a, a link to this evening's program so that you can, can share that far and wide, uh, but also a couple of links. One to DC Vote, which Bo explained a little bit about that organization. It's a really fabulous set of resources. You can really go through the history from, from the founding of the country up till now and, and figure out what those milestones in this campaign have been. Um, and then you can join in with the, the next one, which is signing a petition uh, to, to register your support for DC statehood. Uh, we neglected to include a link to uh, to Senator King to email Senator King, but we can we can get that to you in the, the next few days so that you can let him know how important this is uh, to all of us in the, the name of democracy and in fundamental fairness. Uh, so look for that email and click on the links and, uh, and thank you very much. In the second half of our program this evening, we're gonna hear from a couple of other speakers. First up is DC Council Member Janice Lewis-George. Council Member Lewis-George represents Ward 4 on the Council of the District of Columbia. 
She is a third generation Washingtonian, a native of Ward 4, and a proud graduate of DC Public Schools. We'll have to compare notes later, <laughs> council member. Um, she holds a JD from Howard University School of Law and has worked to advance juvenile justice reform as an assistant attorney general in the DC Attorney General's office. Welcome, Council Member. I'm going to let you uh, give a give a few opening comments, and then we'll turn it. Out. We'll introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I am I'm honored to be here uh, with this uh, esteemed panel and for the chance to share our struggle uh, with the people of Maine. Um, I, I am a DC native, so I was born into taxation without representation, and I have been advocating for DC statehood since I was in high school. Uh, back then, D.C. statehood felt like a, a distant dream, and as strongly as we felt about it, we were struggling to be heard. Um, and, and I'll say this, I was a government uh, and politics major at St. John's University, and I wrote my thesis on D.C. statehood, and most of my classmates were shocked. My professor told me that she learned so much by reading the thesis and was the first time she heard about it. And so it's only recently that the incredible tireless organizing that grassroots DC residents have done for decades is starting to really bear fruit. Um, and obviously through the tireless work uh, of our warrior on the Hill, uh, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton, we've been able to win over the hearts and minds of DC uh, on, on DC statehood through persistent advocacy and relationship building, mobilizing and by sharing our story across state borders. Um, that's why today is so important um, and why I'm so grateful to be in, di in dialogue uh, with you all tonight. Thank you so much, council member. Uh, I'm gonna introduce our next speaker before we, we turn to questions. Next up is Dr. Derek Musgrove. Dr. Musgrove is Associate Professor of History at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, and is the co-author with Maine's own Chris Myers Ash of Chocolate City, A History of Race and Democracy in the Nation's Capital. Dr. Musgrove holds a PhD from New York University and lives with his family in Washington, DC. Welcome, Dr. Musgrove. Thank you, thank you for having me. Um, and, and let me begin with, with giving a shout out to my co-author, Chris Myers-Ash, who is in fact a Mainer. He lives in Hollowell, uh, and I wish I could be up there with him and with all of you, uh, but uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't. I'm, I'm, I'm here in Baltimore teaching, and then I'll, of course, drive home to D.C. in a few. I'd also like to say something to Bo Shuff, which is I can't believe you put me after Eleanor Holmes Norton and Janice Lewis George. Uh, I, I'm clearly going to show up as, as being insufficient behind the two of them, so Thanks a bunch, Bo. Um, but, but let me just say these three things and then we can get to the question and answer. Um, and, and that is that, you know, folks are gonna throw out a lot of questions about, you know, is DC statehood constitutional? Why should people care about it outside of DC? And so I'm gonna try and just start us off by answering those before, before we, we move on. And first thing is, is DC statehood constitutional? Yes, absolutely. And we think that you should support it up there in Maine. Uh, and I'll talk about why in just a moment, but there's no question it's constitutional. Uh, the Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Paragraph um, uh, 17, says quite specifically uh, that Congress should is going to put together a federal district that should be no more than 10 miles square. Now, already in American history, uh, we have a record of reducing the size of the federal district from a full 10 miles square, which is what it was when it was established, in 1790, uh, all the way down to about 63 miles square, which is what it is today. And that's because the Virginia side of uh, the district uh, on the other side of the Potomac um, retroceded back to Virginia in 1846. And so we know that we are capable in this country of changing the size of the federal district. Now, some people will say, well, won't DC statehood eliminate the federal district? Absolutely not. If you look at the DC statehood bill, what it does is it shrinks the size of the federal district down to the area around the White House, uh, around the Capitol, and some of the other federal buildings, and then leaves the other part of the district where all of the 700,000 people uh, who reside there now uh, as, as residents uh, would be in their own state and be able to vote and have the same rights as other Americans. And so we know it's constitutional. <clears throat> 
Some people will say, well, why don't you just retrocede to Maryland? Uh, like the folks on the other side of uh, the Potomac did to Virginia. And there's another simple answer there, which is that we don't want to. <laughs> um, the citizens of DC at a rate of well above 80% stated, in fact, voted that we would prefer statehood as a way of gaining our full citizenship rights uh, as, as citizens of the United States. But more importantly, and I think as Mainers, you will really appreciate this, the District of Columbia has been separate from the state of Maryland for well over 200 years. I mean, that's longer than Maine has been separate than Massachusetts, from Massachusetts, right? So we've developed our own culture, our, our own um, uh, concerns, our own interests, and we want to express them as members of a state. Um, the last thing I'll just answer really quickly is why should a Mainer, why should someone, uh, you know, a, a solid nine hour drive away from the District of Columbia care about uh, DC statehood. And it's really simple and straightforward. I'm going to quote Martin Luther King here. Uh, Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Look, there's 700,000 people in the District of Columbia that don't have full citizenship rights. That creates a degree of mischief in a constitutional democracy, right? Um, people from Utah will come into DC and just do with us what they want. Hey, I think that we should outlaw uh, gay marriage here in Utah. So I'm going to try and force the people of the District of Columbia to adopt a, um, uh, a you know, sort of a referendum voting on whether or not they want to have gay marriage. Someone from Alabama forced us to do that back in the 90s as regarded capital punishment. There's a guy from rural Maryland uh, who decided that he didn't want uh, uh, marijuana to be legal in the District of Columbia. Who cares what the people of the district think? And so you, you have this situation where folks are just dipping into DC and doing whatever they want with 700,000 people's lives, right? And in the process, they're also doing something that's very important to the people of Maine. And that is that they are taking the views of a large group of Americans out of the political equation. When votes are up for conservation in the Senate of the United States, the people of Maine who believe in con conservation, who believe that we should really be focusing on issues like global warming, have two fewer votes in the Senate to support their issues. Pick any other issue that you care about. You've got two fewer votes for people on your side, right? Because if you look at the profile of folks in the, in the MCV and in the District of Columbia, they're pretty similar, right? Um, DC statehood goes through, you get two votes in the Senate and one in the House backing your policy preferences. That's why folks in Maine, that's why you all should care about DC statehood. And thank you so much for, for being willing uh, to talk with us about, about trying to achieve it. Thank you so much. That's a, a we're launching a few campaigns, political campaigns here tonight. We, we already know we're, we're gonna have Congresswoman Holmes Norton running for the Senate. And, and I feel like there's a, you got a political future yourself there, Dr. Musgrove. Thank you very much. Um, just this this question of of congressional interference it is really i i'm going to guess shocking to many of us and and council member lewis georgia i'm wondering you know you're a legislator how does your role as a council yeah. member for the folks who have elected you right how is that impacted by by this weird status and by congressional interference yeah, so it, I mean, uh, it, it's something that surprises people um, often is that when we pass legislation or pass our budget in DC, it has to go, it has to first go through congressional approval, and that means Congress has the ability to block what we do uh, as legislators. And even when they don't block it, there is still sometimes a significant delay because. Uh, we have to go through this process. And, and that can be a big deal uh, when we need to address uh, urgent issues. Um, it's come up a, a number of times um, in, in DC history, um, uh, you know, going back all the way, honestly, you know, in, in, into the 1990s, you know, um, we, a powerful example of how it hurt us is in the 90s, uh, Congress added a, a rider to the budget, which uh, banned DC from using its local funds uh, for a needle exchange program. It was in, in an effort for us to curb at the time uh, was the HIV virus. And, and after 
Uh, and so we weren't able to have any of those programs. After the ban was lifted in 2007, DC like implemented uh, the needle exchange program and the number of HIV cases attributed to drug injections actually dropped astronomically. We went from 150 cases in 2007 to only two cases uh, in 2019. And this was a, a program proven to save lives and we couldn't implement it solely because of our lack of statehood. Uh, we've also seen the issue with Congress blocking our ability uh, to on, on, on criminal justice reform, protecting immigrant rights, uh, decriminalizing marijuana, and so many other in, in issues. Every time those things try to get addressed in, in, in district government, Congress has blocked us from doing it. So, you know, D.C. is not just about um, voting representation in Congress. It's also about our ability uh, to govern ourselves um, as, as district residents. And you know, DC uh, lack of statehood, you know, this year has just, you know, come up even, uh, it, it's been even more difficult as we as a city were dealing with the pandemic, just like every other area. Um, we saw this with the DC vaccine uh, distribution, the federal government initially uh, didn't give us enough vaccines for our healthcare workers, um, and then refused to vaccinate federal workers who live in our region, um, and even denied our request to place a, va a mass vaccination site in our city, even though we had a population that actually met the requirements. And, and this wouldn't happen if we had statehood and two votes in the Senate, in the U.S. Senate, as as leverage. You know, no state, you know, would have been disrespected and undermined in this way. And so. It's not just, you know, it's, it's, it impacts our ability really in, in so many ways um, to protect the lives of our, our residents. So it's not just an a, a inconvenience for us. It really jeopardizes our ability um, to do our best and protect our, uh, our residents, especially in emergency situations. It's just, it's just mind boggling. I mean, this makes no sense. Yeah. What, what possible rationale do opponents to, to statehood, I mean, I, I get the control of the Senate and all of that, I, I don't agree with it, but I understand there's a political case to be made there. What's the case for not letting DC govern itself? How does that make, I'm at a loss. <laughs> You know, it, it makes no sense, you know, as Congresswoman Norton had already said, you know, it's not on, you know, and, and um, Professor Musgrove has already said it, it's not unconstitutional to make D.C. a state and it can be done, you know, without a, a, a constitutional amendment, you know, and every state added to the union after the original 13 has been done the same way, um, uh, the same way D.C. would, you know, um, and, and that's so that's not it, you know, D.C. is not too small to be in state, a state, you know, it, it um it will be the smallest geographically. However, it has a greater population than Wyoming or Vermont and almost as, as many as, as North Dakota or Alaska. And so, you know, um, that's not a, that's a, not an issue. Uh, you know, should those small states give up their status and representation? No, absolutely not. Um, you know, it's, it's, you know, there is really no, you know, credible reason for denying, you know, residents of the district uh, representation. Uh, I thought, you know, like Congresswoman Norton said, you know, we fought as a country about taxation without representation. And yet here in the nation capital, we're still dealing with the very injustice we fought so hard to form this country on. So if there are no credible reasons, <laughs> that means we have to look at the, the not credible reasons, right? Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Musgrove, I'm wondering if you might maybe maybe push a little into the your book, the title of your book. What what's the role that race come plays in DC's lack of representation? Yeah, so it, it, it plays a big one, uh, although perhaps not as a direct one as, as some people think. So so I, I should start off by saying that. You know, initially, when Congress stripped the people of the District of Columbia of voting representation, because for a very brief period before Congress moved to town, but after the district had been created, people in the district voted for members of Congress. So the district is created in 1790. It's, it's sort of chosen by, by uh, 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 President Washington. Uh, it's, it's surveyed, it's laid out. And then for the next 10 years, it's being built. While it's being built, the people who live in the district are voting for members of Congress. Uh, 
On the Virginia side, they're going to Alexandria and they're casting ballots for, for members of Congress from Alexandria. Uh, of course, state legislatures back then uh, selected uh, members of the Senate. And on the Maryland side, they're going to a little town called Bladensburg, which is right on the edge of Washington, D.C., and, and casting votes for members of Congress there. Then Congress comes to town in 1800. Um, and right after the election of 1800, which is a squeaker, remember Thomas Jefferson wins in, in sort of a, 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 a you know, very close election. Um, members of, the, um, of, of his party basically decide that, um, uh, pardon me, member, Federalists, basic, and so it's the, the party that, that's a lame duck, uh, basically decide that they wanna have uh, you know, their vision of a very strong central government instituted as part of the, the U.S. government. Um, and they, as part of that process, they, they effectively strip all district residents of the right to vote and say it's going to be directly administered by members of Congress. Um, and that has nothing to do with race because at that time, slavery is legal in the District of, district of Columbia. African Americans don't vote in the District of Columbia. And it's really after the Civil War and, and, and after Reconstruction that race comes into the fold because it's, it's during uh, uh, the Civil War that African or right after African Americans are allowed to vote in the District of Columbia. They're only about 30% of the population at the time. Um, and after the war, uh, opponents of black voting say, look, not only do we wanna get rid of black voters, but the best way to do it is just to strip everybody in the district of the right to vote, black, white, rich, poor, everybody. And starting in the 1870s for the next 100 years, nobody can vote in DC for anything, not for dog catcher, nothing, right? So for the next 100 years, from the 1870s to 1970s, nobody votes for anything. It's really the civil rights movement that brings the vote back to Washington, DC. Martin Luther King speaks about uh, a DC home rule, having a, a local government and many of his marches in the city. Um, and when the city gets home rule, if you look at its population, it's a significant majority African-American. When we first have city council and mayoral elections in the 1970s, we're a 70% black city. Um, and so from that point forward, race plays a critical role uh, in um, uh, discussions about whether or not we should increase the amount of democracy that DC residents have access to. Um, at the same time, the political parties are sort of shuffling when it comes to issues of race. Um, African-Americans uh, move almost seamlessly into the Democratic Party uh, and the Republican Party sort of adopts a, a policy of racial grievance and sort of you know, creates a coalition against African-Americans. And so what you see happen is that starting in 1980, Democrats are on record as supporting DC statehood from there forward. And starting in 1980, Republicans are on record as opposing not just DC statehood, but any expansion of democratic rights for DC citizens from there down to the present. It's really handy to have a history professor on, on the line. Thank you. That was, <laughs> that was really helpful. Council member, I wonder if you can, can give us the, what's the current situation? What do you see about, you know, the the issues of, of race and racism and how that's playing out in this conversation. Yeah, you know, I think currently, I think what we, we see happening, um, you know, in, in the dish, you know, with, with how race is playing a part in this is, you know, I, I think about, um, you know, some of the issues that we face in our country, even with uh, our criminal justice system, um, you know, one of the things that statehood impacts uh, our ability to do is actually uh, control our own criminal justice system. I know many people don't realize that, but uh, because uh, the federal government actually controls many parts of our, 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 our court system, um, the, the, the U.S. attorney uh, for, that is appointed by uh, the, the federal government is, is who decides uh, what happens with many of our cases. And so where most uh, states uh, have the ability to have a, an attorney general, uh, you know, a head uh, attorney, um, our head attorney is very limited in their powers. And that plays out in a, in a lot of ways when we look at the criminal justice system in the district and having one of those highest rates of mass incarceration in our country. Um, it, you know, it's, it's we don't have a ability to actually have a say in how we wanna see a transformation in that area. 
um, and the ways we want to reimagine it um, because the unelected federal officials aren't accountable to our DC communities. Um, and that can be very concerning and, and, and very harmful, um, especially you know, when we have a, a constant changing federal administration. Um, and and it, it really determines that really determines how we deal with that here in our city. And that has impacted a huge impact on um, black and brown lives in, in the district. Another side of statehood that also uh, is often uh, neglected is that, you know, uh, D.C. is also home to indigenous peoples, um, Native Americans that inhabited this land. Um, and so to this day, uh, the Piscataway people uh, who live in D.C., uh, who are, are, are indigenous people uh, native to this area, uh, live in D.C., but are denied any representation in the U.S. government. Um, and so when you account for the fact uh, that our, our federal governments are actually built on Piscataway land, the denial of sta statehood for those DC residents, I think is even more unacceptable um, and continues to uh, be a huge, you know, uh, unacceptable um, piece of, of, of what, what's happening here in our community. Um, and and I, I would, you know, I know uh, Eleanor Holmes Norm reported this out, but we also have a large number of veterans, but also uh, a large uh, number of uh, veterans, um, black and brown veterans. Um, and it's important to mention that those residents who joined our armed forces, they go overseas, risk their lives in service to this country, but then come back to their homes in the district and don't have a voice in democracy they fought to protect uh, is a whole nother issue. Um, and I think, you know, we continue to have this conversation and the reasons that continue to come up for denying uh, DC statehood are sometimes uh, couched in, oh, well, you know, sometimes, you know, they're, they have crime in their city, like every other metropolitan city in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the country do, right? Just like, you know, New York, Chicago, DC is a metropolitan city. And so, yes, we have that, but that's not a reason to deny uh, anyone a vote, um, you know, a vote and rep real representation in Congress. Um, you know, I just think, you know, it, it really impacts as a whole, you know, and I want to make the broader point about, uh, you know, DC not being a state and how it impacts our country. You know, we've had challenges breaking through to people's consciousness sometimes because people think of it as a local issue and it doesn't impact them. Um, but the reality is that I think depriving full representation to 700,000 plus residents means that our government really actually also does not reflect the will of our country as a whole. You know, we can look at the U.S. Senate and look at where we are now with the two infrastructure bills. We've had an opportunity to pass a bill uh, to address, you know, climate change, uh, you know, child, child care, universal pre-K, family leave, expanded benefits, child, you know, child tax, a number of common sense, popular and desperately needed ideas that are currently being blocked because Congress excludes the will of our communities here in DC. If DC sent its two senators to Congress, we'd be celebrating transformative change that lifts up working people across the country rather than being stuck in this gridlock. And, and that doesn't just apply to um, you know, reconciliation, it applies to issue after issue. Um, and so I, I think it's important to note that as well. We, we often console ourselves with, you know, well, when the state government is is in a less functional phase, mm -hmm. stage, at least we're making progress at the local level. Or when the federal government is having a less less functional period, at least we're making progress at the state level. And and what what you're making really clear is that that doesn't DC doesn't have that right. It's all tied up together. So whatever the current federal climate is, that's what yep. that's what you're dealing with. Absolutely. You know. We are uh, focused, it won't surprise you at all to hear that we're working quite a bit on that build, build Back Better agenda and folks on our list are hearing from us nearly uh, just about every day about how important the, the initiatives there are for, for climate action for, and for our environment. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering how that plays out at the local level in DC. Does congressional interference impact your uh, environment and, and climate initiatives at the local level? Well, it, it always, it impacts everything because when we make, uh, it, as, as we said, when it comes to our budget and it comes to, uh, and, and, and a lot of our, what we put in our budget is, a you know, is can often be tied to and is tied to uh, changes we want to see impacting um, regarding climate change. We passed in DC a Clean Energy Bill, the Omnibus Act, 
uh, to address some of our climate change um, goals in the district that we made for ourselves. But of course, that legislation has to go through Congress. Um, and so it, it's all it always impacts our ability to be able to you know, reach our reach our climate change goals because we're always at the um, at the whim of, of Congress and what they decide should be in our budget, what should what should go forward, and, and what shouldn't. Thank you, oh. Dr. Musgrove. I want I want to go back for just a second to your to the the historical trends um, and and two questions. Can you can you give us a little insight into to why DC became so so significantly black at at certain points, and then the racial makeup of the city has has changed since the 1970s, and and do you think you know tell us a little bit about that and how it may or may not have a an intersection with the statehood movement. Sure. So the um, <clears throat> the demographics of the district are for the 20th century and the 21st century, uh, really, you know, a, a, an exaggerated expression of what's happened to many American cities. Uh, so if you just look back to before World War II, um, the district is is very securely majority white. Um, and you have a, a white population that's well over 60 percent of the city population. Uh, and then two things happened pretty remarkably after World War II. Um, the first is that uh, the suburbs were built around Washington, D.C. Uh, and the suburbs, as many of you I'm sure know, uh, were restricted to, to white Americans. Uh, and so those people who wanted to leave the city, who wanted to get a nice little patch of green that was all their own, get a nice little new house, could head out to the suburbs. Um, and uh, they did in droves. Uh, and they were encouraged by federal policy to do so. The, the Federal Housing Administration gave people low interest loans to head out to houses in the suburbs. Um, the the uh, Highway Act of 1956 gave people an easy way to get out to those suburbs and in fact, encouraged people to turn farms that were just off of a two lane road into big old subdivisions that are now off of an exit on the expressway. Um, and all of that was essentially exclu uh, exclusive to white DC residents because the suburbs were segregated. So at the same time that's happening, the federal government largely because of the dictates of the Cold War and the civil rights movement decides to desegregate Washington DC uh, and other parts of the country, but they focus on Washington DC because it's a symbol of American democracy. And so President Dwight Eisenhower was very adamant, I want DC schools desegregated immediately right after Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And so those two things together, incentives to move to the suburbs that are racially segregated and the federal government attacking segregation inside the city, but not in the suburbs, um, leads 300,000 white DC residents to leave the city between 1950 and 1970. It's more than half of the white population. At the same time, the second great migration is uh, compelling large numbers of African Americans to move into Washington, uh, to the, the DC area, and they can't go to the suburbs, so they have to come to the city. And so the black population in 1940 is about 180,000 people. 200,000 more African Americans moved to the city just between 1940 and 1960, and they keep coming all the way through the early 1970s. Um, and so you see this huge X in the population. The black population rockets to over half a million. The white population plummets uh, from well over half a, half a million down into 300, even the, the, the high 200,000. Uh, and so you go from a city that's it's essentially 60 some percent white, uh, and in fact, more than that before World War II, to one that's 73% black by 1970, right? Um, and since that time, you, you've had a sort of reverse migrations. Um, the Fair Housing Act of 1968 opened up the suburbs around DC to African Americans. And just like the white middle class before them, they wanted a nice little patch of green to themselves, good schools, new houses. And they headed out to the suburbs in earnest, primarily into Prince George's County on the Maryland side. Um, at the same time, uh, first during the 1970s as part of a trickle, and then after 2000 as a wave, um, large numbers of young uh, white Americans began wanted to move back to the cities. 
um, because the suburbs could, you know, for many of those people in the 70s, uh, they considered them very boring. Uh, but also in the 2000s, they were expensive, like gas, you know, shot up in price after Katrina. Um, people didn't want to sit in long, horrible commutes. Uh, and so you started to see this, this, this opposite cross migration. Uh, because as you know, as, as more and more uh, white Americans moving back into the city, it became more expensive. And so more and more poor black, uh, poor African Americans began to move out. Um, so today the city is, is you know, approximately um, low 40% African American, um, I believe either high 30 or low 40% white, uh, and then the remainder are, are Latinos and, and, and Asians as well. Um, and so you have a very multicultural city today, but it is in flux as it has been pretty consistently uh, since um, uh, World War II. Uh, now, what does that mean for, for when it comes to issues of governance? Um, you know, in the past, it's actually meant that the suburbs didn't want to help us out that much. And so there was a statehood bill that went to the Congress in 1993. And everybody in the suburbs, except I think for one person, maybe, uh, no, it was everybody, uh, all the members of Congress, voted against the D.C. statehood bill in 1993. And they did that because they worried that if DC became a state, they'd start taxing the people that lived in the suburbs but worked in the city. A majority of the people that work for the federal government in the city have always lived in the suburbs since the 1960s, right? Um, and so, you know, when people talk about DC being this home of, of bureaucrats, what they're really talking about is suburban Maryland and suburban Virginia, right? Uh, the, the, the people who work in DC are bus drivers, they're teachers, and some are also federal bureaucrats, but they're not the majority of the working population. Um, and so you, you'd have effects like that based on the demographic changes. I am so grateful for the, the historical perspective, the current perspective, the political landscape. You have both just given us such a, a gift this evening and walking us through this uh, what is both a, a co complex and just incredibly simple question of fairness. So, so thank you. Uh, I want to close with a, a sort of fun question. Since there is does not appear to be any good argument against <laughs> statehood, what's your favorite silly reason? What's the most ridiculous <laughs> reason that you've heard what's the one that keeps you uh, you know a smile on your face after all of these terrible ordeals um you know one that has come up that is is hilarious is that um somehow the district residents we will have the mo we would have so much influence over congress like we would have a plus a plus one type of influence over congress so someone said you know there's statehood signs in people's yards. And like, you know, it was, it was like, what, you know, I was riding on to Capitol, I was riding to Capitol, you know, up to the Capitol and I saw statehood signs in the yard. And that's the type of advocacy DC residents would be able to have and impact Congress. You know, I was like, this is ridiculous. <laughs> As if, you know, us, you know, us being in DC, DC being a state would mean that rep representatives would abandon their constituents for whatever we want to happen. So that one was just absolutely <laughs> ridiculous. Yeah. And I continue to just too um, much influence. Wow. Got it. Watch that's, out, right? <laughs> that's next to the one about the airport. That's it. <laughs> that's it. I think the con I think the councilwoman got me on that one. I mean, that was really pretty crazy. I think that was that unfortunate gentleman from uh, maybe it was a Heritage Foundation that was, that was <laughs> testifying before uh, Congress about about the bill. Um, you know, the other one I, I really liked was that DC doesn't have any car dealerships. Uh, I think that was might have been Tom Cotton. Yes. Uh, and one we do. Uh, but 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 two, I, I didn't know that car dealerships were in the Constitution as as a uh, as a requirement for statehood. So I, I guess I learned something from from the good senator. That's right. We learn something every day. Oh my goodness. Well, I'm glad that that we can check that box, and you do have car dealerships, so everything should be settled. <laughs> Bo, do you have a favorite you want to throw in here? <laughs> Um, I do. Bowling alleys was absolutely my favorite. Uh, it was along the lines of the car dealerships. I'm actually working on getting a bowling shirt made just in case uh, I get stuck at one of our actual several bowling alleys. 
Uh, but it's just the same notion of ridiculousness that we heard about the other ones. Well, it's good to end with a laugh because boy, is this a serious topic. And um, I am grateful to everybody for joining us tonight to, to learn a little bit more. As I said, you will get an email um, from us later this evening or tomorrow with the links to that to DC vote and to sign that petition. Uh, you can, can reach out to Senator King. Uh, this is a program that we often almost always run on Friday noon times. And so this is a very special week in that we have two, we have the dinner and learn and the lunch and learn. You still have time to join us tomorrow to, uh, to explore Penobscot stories for the 21st century. You will have uh, Penobscot language keeper, Carol Dana and a couple of professors joining us to, to talk about what we can learn from, from um, traditional Penobscot stories. Dr. Musgrove, Councilmember Lewis George, Bo, thank you so much for joining us. Have a fabulous night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks so much thank for you having so me. Much. Thank you.